Come on, y'all ready to turn it loose? That's what this series is all about this month. We've went away from a topical series for the month of June. I felt God told me, just turn it loose. Turn every preacher that we have in Reach Church at both campuses loose. And so there's live preaching at both campuses, every service and, and every word that's being brought. Les is up there in Colleen today bringing a word that God has put within his heart for that campus. I'm here today to be able to do what God has called me to do. As God is directing this in us, we got to be open and ready and, and willing to be able to hear. These are going to be words, each and every one of them beginning even with this one here today. These are words that are not just a topic, but again, they are a word that God has birthed within our heart. That means he wants us to really pay attention. This is a corporate word for our life because I'm going to tell you to set this message up today. We are in need. The body of Christ is in need. The church, the believers are in need of specific words from God in such a time as this. When you look at the world today, today and you see where everything is at. It's crazy. It's chaotic. You read the newspaper and you feel like you're either reading a circus or you're reading a horror story. Mass shootings everywhere. Politicians losing their minds. These people doing this. We celebrate that. We don't do that. And I mean, it's just, it's crazy right now. And what I want to tell you is this. Everything is first in the supernatural taking place. The natural world that we live in, the natural life that we have is nothing more than the supernatural. It's a reflection of the supernatural. What do I mean by that? You were even created supernatural before you were given a body. In Jeremiah, God declared that he knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. That means he gave you your spirit first. He birthed your spirit first. And then he gave that spirit a soul and put both into a body. That's why the Bible says that this body is temporal. From ashes it came and from ashes and dust, so it will return. But our our life, our, our soul, our life source, our spirit, they will live on forever. So everything that we see happening in the natural is merely a reflection of what's really happening in the supernatural. And if you don't think that's true, you're not sure even what I'm saying. I'm going to show you today, and I believe that God is going to open your heart. He's going to open your mind, and more importantly, he's going to open your eyes so that you'll have eyes to see what's going on in this world today is absolutely a fight. And what the word God gave me was this, is protect this house. Protect this house. What does that mean? What is this house? This house is threefold, really. This house is the building we meet in. This is this is not a, a, a temple per se, but we've declared it to be the house of God. Even though it's in a strip center, we hold meetings here. We gather the church here. So this has become the house of God. But your body, the Bible says, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So you are the house of God. But then we together, the Bible also teaches us that we together, we make up the body of Christ. And some scriptures refer to it as the house of God. So all of us together as a church are the house of God. The building we meet in is the house of God. Your personal life is the house of God. Your life and your being is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so when God gave me this word, protect this house, I felt like it was a command from him to me to do what he has called me to do as a senior leader of this church, to be able to protect you, to protect this place, to be able to protect our family in such a crazy time. And the only way that we can really find protection, and we're going to see it today, is in Jesus. And that's what we're going to reveal. Because we are all right now noticing, and I think that you're witnessing, the world is upside down and inside out. Its way of thinking is just crazy. The smallest way of thinking, the way that used to be just a small portion, which still is a small portion of society, all of a sudden every bit of the way that those people are thinking is now governing how the entire world is run. And we look at it through politics, to social society, to the media, to, to Hollywood, to, to reality, even living in our own city here in Austin, and we know this, we are in a fight. Whether you believe it or not, whether you think you signed up for it or not, whether you want to be, you can't escape it. You are in a fight even if you've never said yes to Jesus, even if you've never declared yourself a Christian, you're in a fight for your eternity. There's a war waging on the inside of you, and you feel torn between two things. The Bible promises it, and I lived it. I know it. So you're in a fight regardless. It's just the best part about being in a fight on the side of God is that you're on the winning side. 
Because God is a lot like Ricky Bobby in that way, right? If you're not first, baby, you're last. There is no second place outside of God. It's win or lose. And we are in a fight, and it's not a natural fight. I served 10 years in the Marine Corps. I know. I grew up in the streets. I know what natural fighting is. And I'm telling you what we are experiencing right now is not a natural thing. It's all happening first in the supernatural. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Paul says a final word. That means, okay, I'm saving the best for last. The one thing I want you to walk away with, he's saying, this is it. Be strong. Don't be weak. Don't be timid. Don't be a sissy. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Verse 12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Against mighty powers in dark places. Look at that. Against what kind of powers? But what do we read first? A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So whose power is more mighty than his? None. So we're not supposed to get afraid when we read this. We're supposed to get excited. That we are in a fight. Whether we want to be or not, we're in it. And if we're in it, it's better to be on the winning side. And it's better even though that these mighty powers of darkness are at war in this, in this atmosphere, in this world, his power is even more mighty. And against evil spirits in the heavenly places. See, people have been deceived for far too long. You think you're fighting with your spouse or with your girlfriend or with your boyfriend. You think that you, you're constantly in turmoil at your workplace with your boss or with, with a coworker. You, you, you think that, that you came to church, and not this one, but hopefully, but, but you came to church and you got offended or you got hurt by somebody there, and you think that it's just people being people. But the truth is, no evil can stem out of humanity. Evil stems from Satan. That's where it came from. God gave humanity life, and he made them perfect to never die, to never make a mistake. But he gave them a free will to make a choice. And when humanity sinned, then they fell out of the grace of God. And then Jesus came in, and he brought everything back to order. But we still have a choice. And so when we know this, I'm not in a fight. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to believe this at least. When I'm driving in Austin, especially down 183 or 35, which I try to avoid at all costs, I want to buy a helicopter even if it's like a fake one that just looks like it's real. When that dude cuts you off on the highway and then goes 10 miles an hour under the speed limit, I just gotta, I gotta believe the best for that guy that that's on him, that's really the devil, you know? The devil made him do it because he's trying to really get me to flesh out right now. Now I'm just joking with that, but here's the truth. Is there a devil, be, a devil behind every tree? No, there's not. We don't need to be so super spiritual that we're spooked out. That oh my! But I'm going to tell you, there's one behind almost every tree. It may not be behind every single one, but almost every one. There is a fight that is warring, that is raging, that is waging around us. And we have to understand that we're in it. The fight is over us. The fight is over our eternity. The fight is over our purpose, our destiny. So this is the, the word for each of us as individuals. You better then be on your guard. Don't be silly. Don't be naive. Don't be ignorant to the devices of the enemy, the Bible says. Well, read it. I'm taking this message. I'm doing part two of it this Wednesday night. Where we're going to go deeper that we don't have time to do today. We're going to go deeper on Wednesday night. Because here's the thing is, we can walk around so ignorant and so naive that we just think, well, I mean, that's just a bunch of spiritual stuff. I really don't want to get involved in that. Well, you keep living that life, and we'll see where your life ends up in the end. Because there is a fight, and we better be on guard. Look at 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, not your coworker. Not your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your spouse. Not your, not your schoolmate. Are you hearing this? The great, your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. He prowls around like. He's not the real lion. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. The devil is not a creator. He's an imitator. He's a perverter. All he's trying to do is imitate and pervert the ways of Jesus. But he's saying to us here very clearly, 
that he hunts like a lion. So if we're going to be on our guard, then we better be keen to the strategy of the enemy. That's what we're going to look at on Wednesday night in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, where it says, we know all too well the strategies of the devil. Do we? Paul did. The church and the book of Acts did. But do we? And we're going to. I can promise you this. I can't say the whole church is a whole around the world, but I can take care. I can protect what God has called me to protect. Because there is a big bad devil, but he's not like the big bad wolf. He doesn't come huffing and puffing and threatening to blow your house down. Where you, get, where you see him and, and, and you got time to prepare. No, he's a snake. He's slimy. He slithers in underneath your foundation. Comes up while you don't even know what's happening. Comes in through your sewer pipes. And then pops up right on your throne as soon as you're seated. If you get what I'm saying, right? He catch you in a bad situation. And that's what he's like. This is the next one. Our enemy is ruthless and relentless. The devil don't take a day off. The devil's not going to take it easy on you because you have a bad day. He's going to make it worse. He wants you dead. John 10.10, Jesus said, the thief, Satan, he comes only, no other reason. He doesn't come for any other reason than this, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. In the original language, the word steal means to come in by stealth. How does a lion hunt? A lion comes in by stealth, undetected, creeps in, to kill. The word kill means to take up by the throat. When a lion grabs a hold of an animal and doesn't bite it to death, it snatches it up by its throat and suffocates it. Why? Because air, the breath, is life. And how did God create man? He created him out of the earth and he breathed his breath of life into them. The devil wants to just, he wants to steal your breath, your wind in your sails. And that's the Holy Spirit. And destroy, and the word destroy means to render useless. This is his ultimate goal, is to render you useless. To make you so useless that you, you mean no good to society or to your fellow believers. The devil's so good at doing this. Sometimes he comes right at us with demented thoughts, suicidal thoughts, uh, anxiety, stress, all these different things. But sometimes it's like uh, boiling a frog. I had a guy tell me, when you boil a frog, I've never boiled a frog. I probably will never boil a frog because I won't eat them. Right? I'm not going to boil what I don't eat. I just think it's kind of crazy to even eat a frog. If you think about it, it's pretty disgusting. If you eat frogs, take offense if you want. But I'm going to talk about it in a minute. But they say when you boil a frog, you don't want to throw a frog into a pot of boiling water because it'll jump out. That you want to slowly, you want to put them in normal water and slowly increase the temperature. The devil's good at boiling Christians. Slowly increase, getting you real busy with school, with sports, getting you real busy with kids and 15 different activities, getting you real distracted with what's in entertainment and what's going on in the world today and, and get you real. And I'm not against all of that or any of that. I'm just for God. I'm for putting God first in my life, putting God first in my family, putting God first in my finances so that I could be first in my future. Are you hearing me now? Everything has to be done in moderation. Because he just turns the heat up slowly, and before you know it, you become lukewarm, and before you know it, boy, you're boiling. But look what Jesus said. Jesus said, but I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. That word abundantly means overflowing. The word abundantly means without limits. The word abundantly means without fail. So Jesus said, yeah, the big bad devil, he's come to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life. And the life I'll give you will be so overflowing, he can't steal it. He can't touch it unless you surrender it. That's what Jesus does. So we know our enemy. We, this is why we have to protect our personal life, our family, and this church family. Because he's ruthless, he's relentless. We're in this fight. And we know that he's not taking a day off and he's not giving up. Then what do we do about it? How do we protect this house? And I've got three points for you. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. But just hear this and hear this clearly. You can't do it alone. You're not strong enough. Neither am I. I don't care how, how good you are, how, how much faith you have. I don't care how, how determined, what strong will you have. There's no self-made person in this earth. And there's no lone rangers that succeed in God. 
Matthew 18, verses 18 through 20, here's the key. Our power is in our numbers. Our power is in our numbers. We together, Jesus said, hear this before we go into Matthew 18. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He didn't say, I'm going to build my Christian. I'm going to build my believer. I'm going to build my little guy over here, girl over here. They're going to be a superstar. He said, I'm going to build my family. I'm going to build my institution. Not a religious, stupid organization that the church, unfortunately, has come. We can't stand religion here at Reach Church. I chase it out every time I see it. Because it's not of God. Jesus came into this earth. You know what he did? He cracked the religious between the eyes, left and right. And he loved the sinners like they'd never done anything wrong. The religious mindset is more dangerous than the atheistic mindset. Because it has a bit of the truth to deceive people enough to spoil them when it gets in. And with that said, when we feel like we can do this on our own, then we're going against the very fabric of God's being. We're going against the way we've been created. We're going against the way that Jesus has, has called us to go. And what ends up happening is we end up opening ourselves up to that First Peter 5, 8. That devil's prowling around. You know who he's looking for to devour? He's looking for the weak. He's looking for those that have been hurt. That's how a lion hunts. Lion doesn't go up to the strength of the pack. They wait for a young one, a weak one, a hurt one. They wait for an old one. To me, that represents religion, that old way of thinking. They wait for them to stray away from the pack. And once they stray away, then they come in between them and the pack. They isolate them, and then they come in for the kill. I got a video here that we showed a few years ago, part of a different series, but it fits perfectly in today's message that shows us the challenge that we're up against and what the enemy's doing and how a lion hunts so that we could be knowledgeable against his strategies. Because here's what happens is this family of buffalo, they're cape buffaloes and, and, and they, they stray away from the pack. The dad's one of the biggest bulls. He thinks he's got this. He thinks he could do this. He doesn't need a church. I don't need to go to church. I got Jesus, right? He strays away with his, with his wife, with his, with, with his mate, and with his, with his calf. And let's see what happens when this thing unfolds. Pause it right there. Hey, look, you had a bad day? <laughs> this calf gets attacked by a lion, then two, then four, then six, then a whole pride is on top of this calf. And then if the bad day ain't bad enough, a now crocodile comes up out of the water and snatches it up and starts playing tug of war with it and a pride of lions. That's a really, really bad day. Would you agree? And the parents, they took off running. Did they just abandon their kid? They leave him behind? No. 
They got smart. And they went running to get the family. Let's look what happens when they go get their family, when they go get the, the numbers and come back. Buffalo versus Lions, part two. Awesome. They came back and that calf got rescued. Not because it was strong enough on its own, but because it had a family that had its back. There's a few other reasons why that calf even survived long enough for the family to rescue him. Number one is that calf was a fighter. You see, it continued to try to stand up even in the midst of all that instead of giving up when it's getting knocked around. It's still fighting and still standing. And number two is it didn't have thin skin. It had thick skin. What do I mean by that? Sometimes we have too thin a skin and we get so easily offended at our coworkers or at, at our spouse or our friend or we get offended even at a church or, or at a pastor. We get offended, well, they don't do it the way that I think they should be doing it. If it was me, well, then go do it. Go start your own company. Go start your own church. See how easy it is. You got all the answers, right? Go do it. Go do it and see how great it is. So that critical spirit, that's a part of religion. That comes from the enemy. That's not of Jesus. Not saying that if we are in a moment where we know that there are things that in our workplace are unhealthy for us, or if there's a, a family of believers that we belong to that something unhealthy is there, of course that should be addressed. But I'm talking about being thin-skinned where everything doesn't live up to your standard. Right? That, that, so then we want to call ourselves perfectionists. Well, I'm just a perfectionist after all. But really, you're just critical. You're thin-skinned, and you're going you're gonna to end up hurting yourself and hurting others around you. Our power is in our numbers, not in ourself. That's what the Bible tells us, yes? Y'all getting real quiet up in this Presbyterian church this morning. Look at Matthew 18, 18 through 20. I'll tell you what it tells us. I tell you the truth. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. This is Jesus. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything that you ask my Father in heaven, he will do it for you. For where two or three are gathered together as my followers, in my name, the King James says, I am there among them. So there's the key. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I already am, been waiting on you. That's why Jesus said, I will build my church. He ain't coming to you. He wants you guys to come to him in unity, all of us to come to him in unity. Is this making sense right here? This is the heartbeat of us seeing these things through is knowing that there is power within our numbers. You know, right here we can see where two or three are gathered together. One plus one in the natural equals two. But we know that when two of us, just me and you, come together, Jesus is already there. So one plus one equals, no, it doesn't equal three either. Because that would mean that Jesus is just as powerful as we are. That's all he could do. But Jesus promised that when we do this, that anything that we ask of the Father in heaven, it will be done for us. So what that means is one plus one equals whatever we need. See, I draw strength from you today. You draw strength from each other. We all draw strength from one another. 
You don't even know it. You just being here, you may not even get involved yet. You may not even be on a life group or be in a life group or on the dream team or any of those things, but you just being here makes a difference in other people's lives because this is where the source of power is. The devil can't have you here unless I start acting like some idiot pastor, get insecure, and then want to start hurting the own people that God has called me to protect. And I told Jesus from the beginning, I'll never do this. I'm not playing politics in church. I'm not playing religious stupid games. I'm coming to win your people to you to serve them, to love them, to bless them, to lay my life down for them. And if I can't do that, I'm walking away from it. Because that's the way it's supposed to be. And all of us together, we make each other better. The next one is our security is in our lifestyle. So our, our power is in our numbers, but our security is in our lifestyle. See, I can't find security in you. And you can't find security in me. The only place security comes from is God. Real security. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13 through 17 this is a continuation of what we read about the armor of God it says therefore put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil would you agree that we are in a time of evil then after the battle you will be able to stand firm stand your ground therefore having done everything you can do to stand stand some more be like that calf don't quit don't give up putting on and I'm going to go through the full armor here. It says the helmet of salvation. Here's what I want you to understand. I'm going to go through it, each piece of this armor. But this has never been called to just hurry up and put it on because you're in a fight. No, you're always in a fight. Keep it on. Sleep in your armor. Shower in your armor. Right? When you go to a computer, have your armor on. When you're driving, Jesus, help me, have your armor on. What does it look like? The helmet of salvation. That means salvation should be a part of my lifestyle. I shouldn't just act saved when I come to church. That'd be terrible. Can you imagine a preacher doing that? I shouldn't act saved when I just come to church. I should live a lifestyle of salvation. Again, none of this means I'm perfect. None of it means I got it all together. None of it means any of us are. None of us are perfect. We're all working on each other and working on ourselves by being together like we are. We're working on each other. But internally, my lifestyle is between me and God. The breastplate of righteousness, that means I need to live a lifestyle of righteousness. The belt of truth, I don't want to just not lie in front of the preacher or not lie. I only want to tell the truth when it benefits me. No, I need to live a lifestyle of truth. The shoes of peace, nobody's robbing me of my peace. You can ask anybody that knows me real good personally. Nobody has the right to take the peace that God paid the highest price of this son from my life. Period. I won't let it happen. That's my duty to make sure nobody takes my peace. My shield of faith. My faith isn't supposed to be activated when something goes wrong. My faith is supposed to be activated so nothing does go wrong. My faith is to take the fiery darts of the enemy so that they stick to my faith and not in me. Are you hearing this now? And then my sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I don't want to just read the Bible when I come to church. Because then I'm susceptible all week to stupid thoughts because the devil sure is speaking his word into my ear all week long. So what's God saying? And I need to be in the word all the way through. That's why we do the one-year Bible reading plan here at Reach Church so that we can, we can grow and we can self-feed and not just depend on weekends or Wednesdays. And then look at this last piece, praying in the spirit at all times on every occasion. Praying in the spirit is not your spiritual 911 system. Praying in the Spirit is supposed to be a part of your lifestyle so that you can look at it says, stay alert, be persistent in your prayers for all believers. For how many believers? And where? Everywhere. So when we're doing these things, we are not just building ourselves, we're building each other. We're protecting one another. And the next one is this, the last one, is our victory is in His blood and our testimony. My victory is not in the, 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 the fleshly things I do. My victory is in the spiritual realm. My victory is I don't get victory if somebody's offended me and I tell them off. That's not a victory for me. A victory is if somebody offends me that I forgive them because I've put it under the blood of Jesus and I've lived the testimony of what he's called me to live. Revelation 12, 11, they, the believers, overcame him, Satan, because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their 
testimony. Our victory is in the blood of Jesus. He paid the highest price. And it's in our testimony. What does it mean? In our testimony, in the word of our testimony. There's two words used in the Greek language for word when the New Testament was written. And there's one that's logos, which is written word, and the other one is rhema, which is spoken word. And most people think that this, the word of our testimony, is our word, literally, us telling our testimony, that that's what overcomes the enemy. But that's not the case. The word, word here in the original language is written word. Well, what does that mean? How is our testimony? Does that mean I'm just supposed to journal and show everybody my diary? That's what Facebook's for, apparently, right? <laughs> Unfortunately. But hear this now. What it means is this, God said, I will take the flaming finger of the Holy Spirit and I will engrave my word within your heart. I have hidden my word within your heart. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So in other words, as the word is in my heart, so my life is on display. I don't want to tell you how good I am as a Christian. I want to show you how good I am as a Christian by the way that I live. That's the word of my testimony and when we do these things when we surrender to the blood when we live the lifestyle that God has called us to live and when we know that we know that with everything inside of us is it, as great as we may think we all are we need each other we need each other to make this can we give Jesus one big one just thank him for his word such a clear clear understanding he gives us in this I'm going to ask just for a moment if we can bow our head and close our eyes. I just want to send some encouragement to each and every one of you. I'm going to pray a prayer over our whole family here for strength and for courage. But before we do that, there may be somebody here today that you don't know that you know where your life is with Jesus. Folks, it's so simple. I used to make it complicated before I got saved before I surrendered my heart I used to make it complicated I allowed the devil to make it complicated but Jesus made it so simple he said if you just say yes to me if you just ask me to forgive you of every mistake of every sin of every wrong you've ever done I'm going to be faithful and just to forgive you and if you will declare that I am the son of God then you will spend the rest of eternity with me and all glory. That's how simple it is. But the world and our own selves and the end, it just gets twisted up. But today, let's let's get all the, the smoke blown away. If you've never said yes to Jesus, or maybe you've once said yes, but your life has not lived up to the commitment that you once made, then recommit that yes. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you want to say yes or recommit that yes. And we're going to pray a prayer right there with you in your seat. And now it's time for you to be bold, for you to be courageous. You're not worried about anybody that's around you. You're not worrying about what anybody else is going to think. You worry about you and you alone. If that's you right here, right now, and you want to say yes or recommit that yes, on the count of three, put that hand up nice and high in the air, and we'll pray a prayer right where you're at. On three. One, two. Hands are already going up. Three. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see each and every one of those hands. For all of you that raise that hand, place it right on your heart. And we're going to pray this prayer together, and I want you to pray where your own two ears can hear it. But I'm going to ask everybody that's here, let's join in and back them up as they pray this prayer. Let's all of us pray with them. Just say, Jesus, I believe in you. You are the Son of God. You gave your life for me. Now I give my life to you. Forgive me for every mistake, every sin I've ever made. Give me a fresh start, a new beginning. From this day forward, I dedicate everything I have to you. Give me the strength and the courage to live it for you. In Jesus' name. Can we give all those folks one big, huge congratulations? 
Tell them how proud we are of them. It's the most amazing decision you could ever make in your life. If you just made that decision, or this is your first time with us here at Reach, that card that we talked about in the video is in the seat back in front of you, behind you. If you could take just a few seconds right now, fill it out. You can fill out the bottom part of it, tear it off, drop it in the offering basket when it goes by, and we'll be sure. We're not going to harass you. We're not coming to your door with a loaf of bread or nothing like that. We're just going to send you one letter thanking you for coming. If you're here for the first time, we're thanking you for coming, and then we're also going to give you some information on how to get connected to reach and to God in a better and a deeper way. So if you can fill that out, drop it in. We'll send that letter out this week to you guys. And this time we're going to be receiving that offer. And I want to say the same as we always say, folks, if this is your first time with us, don't feel any pressure to give. Nobody in this room should feel any pressure to give. The church, unfortunately, has been demented and sick in its ways at times and has manipulated people for their finances. But that's not what giving is about. Giving is not about the church wanting your money. That's not what that's it's about at all. What giving is, is Jesus said giving is a way for us to break through freedom and show God that money is not our God. He said there's only two gods in this world that you could serve, either me or money. Choose me. So when we give, do you know right now we're giving everything that we give goes towards advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right now, we have a team that we've sent to Africa with Mission SOS. They've seen over 2,000 people give their life to Jesus in the streets. In the streets alone. That's our team out there winning people to Jesus. And then as a whole, as the, as the festivals go, there's now been over already. I haven't got the numbers from last night or what will happen tonight is the last night is tonight. But what has happened already is over 15,000 people have said yes to Jesus. That's what we're doing. We're... We're, we're backing up the gospel and helping to take it forward. So I'm going to pray a prayer blessing over it. As you guys get it prepared, you can drop an offering, goes by. Video announcements will be up afterwards, and Tom will come up to close it out. Pray a blessing over you guys. I just want to speak this real clearly before we do that, though. If you've not been connected to a life group or the dream team, the, the way to serve God's house or the way to connect to other believers that are like-minded, it's so critical. What we've talked about today is all about the importance of us getting connected. You'll see a video here, and there's a card on the seat also that'll give you some information on how to get deeper connected with people that you can live life with, you can laugh with, you can enjoy, you can enjoy your time with, but you can also grow stronger in God with. So I'm praying we're gonna go to those videos. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give into your kingdom. I pray right now that upon each and every gift and each and every giver, that you would bring a holy blessing. God, I declare it blessed. I declare a hundredfold blessing upon every gift, every giver. God, I thank you for, your, for their obedience. I thank you for their sacrifice, God. And I pray, all of us, God, that we would have the right attitude that we are given to win people to you. In Jesus' name, amen.